Malawi uh, was kind of what we called a flower. <clears throat> it was a bunch of these rooms all radiating around the middle like, like flower petals. And the middle was the water catchment cisterns. The reason we didn't do that here <clears throat> is because of the wind. This, this was aimed at primarily being a storm shelter, that w- a building that would not be blown away in a typhoon. And that's everything else was secondary to that. Yes, it's going to make its own electricity and cool itself and treat its own sewage and harvest its own water and use recycled materials. But the primary thing was that it not be something that gets blown away. They, they, they rebuild every time there's a typhoon. Everything just blows away. And uh, so the, the idea here was to make it not be uh, a building that would be damaged in a typhoon. So that's, that's the main reason the rooms face each other. It's like a fort. When, when you see this scaffolding gone and buried all the way around with two big gateways out from those doors, those arches, uh, they would be closed. And the storm would be up there in the sky, but it wouldn't make it into this protected area. This is semi-protected here, and that's totally protected in there. So the design of this was aimed at not uh, being destroyed in a typhoon. Okay. And you have been a conductor of the in Vietnam. I'm sorry about that, so because it's quite wide angle, so we need yeah, to... Yeah, okay, I understand that. Yeah. I wasn't sure what you were saying at first. <laughs> <laughs> Get that out of here. <laughs> yeah. uh, so you put down a drawing just after the disaster we saw uh, on the internet how this idea is, is born, how you had this idea. Well, we've been doing this all over the world for decades and then after the typhoon I said, well, these buildings that we have been building are already half typhoon proof because they're buried on one side or two sides, three sides. So I said, why don't we just make two of them facing each other? And because uh, we've had that experience before in high winds, these things you don't even know the wind's blowing. And so we just took a standard design and faced it off against another standard design and made it, uh, you know, we're making a fortress against the wind. And it's, it's a building that we've built many times, but we just faced two of them together rather than making them face the sun, which is what we do in a cold climate. Okay. For our last question then the other days. Uh, and also this one will have a botanic cells and so on like the equipment of the standard. Yeah, it'll have sewage treatment that is, uses the botanical cell method and uh, so no sewage will leave into the ground or anything. It'll all be used and reused. All right. Thank you. <laughs> Talking to Phil, he was saying one of the big issues of being able to replicate this many times over is of course funding. And yeah. um, I mean, how do you see strategy going forward to get more funding? What would that take? I mean, well, could you look to? We we didn't have any funding, uh, you know, like when it, we went to the Indian Andaman Islands after Haiti, I went to my bank and borrowed 50 grand. Uh, I mean, that was after uh, the tsunami. And in Haiti, we did a little fundraiser. And But now we've gotten to the point where uh, the people, lots of people around the world want to work with us and learn. And so we charge them a tuition. And their tuition buys the materials and it buys our plane tickets. And so we're funded by the people that come out here and slave in the hot sun and help us. So everybody here not only is building this building, but they funded this building. Grassroots. And that's kind of a, you know, rather than waiting around for Bill Gates or Oprah Winfrey or somebody like that to donate money and then, uh, you know, uh, get a bunch of credit for it or whatever, uh, this method is all about people. People are funding them. So, Wherever we decide, we know. So when I when I just heard about the typhoon in the Philippines, I sat at my kitchen table and made a sketch, and then got it up on our website, and money started coming in. So I just said, "Is there anybody interested in helping us do this?" And people started saying, "Yes, I am. Yes, I am." Three hundred people said it. And, you know, we can only take forty or fifty. So it's the whole thing because of the knowledge that's transferred and the concepts that are being explored is funding itself now. It's like, a, it's, it's, we can go anywhere we want. Uh, we just pick the next place and set it up. It takes three or four months to raise the money and get the design together and go do it. Yeah, a big part of this project is transferring the knowledge to the locals. And I'm wondering in previous projects, 
has that have you seen that um, they've continued to replicate and live within it one in particular was that we did a school in Sierra Leone and uh, we it had eight rooms of like flower petals around a center of water and we only had money and time to do two of the flower petals and we worked really hard with about ten of them right shadowing us and we left and it was six months later but they sent us a picture and it was all done so we know that it's possible we're always trying to make the design easier and you know uh, uh, easier in using more indigenous materials to the area so we are constantly evolving it but we're starting to have success at having people replicate and I think that's the idea thanks thank you, thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. That'll be completing the the botanical cells, the grey water, the shower, bathroom, all this, and then following that, you'd like um, to see another wave of volunteers to build a, a home home size earthship. Home that type, yeah. That's home type Using earthship. less cement and rebar yeah, and, more and more palm local. trees and bamboo. Yeah. And I think we can do it. As a matter of fact, what I might do. We're going to leave Jim Well and a few people here to keep going a little bit, but uh, I think I'll organize the next 10 day hit to be uh, a team for doing the systems and the botanical cells and everything, and then a few people to do the home, the mm -hmm. home with the palm trees and the bamboo. That's similar concept, but you can, you can cut the trees here, you can cut the bamboo here, you can gather the tires here. You know, you're talking a thousand dollars in materials, maybe. Mm. So we're, I think, if we put that up, we just didn't want to do that for a storm shelter for a school. Yeah. When they told us it was going to be a storm shelter for a school, we shifted into another gear. But for the people, that would be the thing. Because mm. that's the question that's being asked. Like I said before, is how in a in an environment like this, where concrete and rebar is quite expensive. Um, do local people come up with those types of materials? So it's about them adapting the design or, or coming yeah. in with a, a home type design that where they can see, oh yeah, we can do that, we can apply that and build these ourselves without too much expense. And I think if we show that, that, I think we have a chance of that working. Mm. Because I'm looking at what they're building with. They're building with the palm trees cut up into lumber and they're using nails and screws and tin. Mm. So. They have tires here, they're free, and they have the palm trees, we could use them. They have bamboo, and that's all they would need. So they could just have a much more substantial shelter that they built themselves. Okay, and so if people want to um, donate to Earthship and um, contribute to this cause, whether they want to come over as a volunteer, or if they want to just donate financially to help with materials and stuff, who should they contact and uh, what's the best way to go about doing that? Uh, our website, earthship.com, has uh, all of our current projects and you, you click on Philippines if you want to get involved or donate to the Philippines and it has a button where you can go to PayPal and make a PayPal donation. Okay. Cool. Thanks guys. <laughs> and we're doing it, yeah, right now we're still getting met, uh, donations for Malawi for materials and getting donations for the Philippines and then we get, we're still getting donations for Haiti. You know, okay. people send five dollars, ten dollars, uh, and then some people send a hundred dollars and say use it for whichever one, you know, because mm. we're we're always going out there. As soon as we get money, we go again. Mm. One more question on uh, funding. You mentioned earlier, you know, you're not sitting around waiting for Bill Gates, which I think is wise. But how, is that something that you have tried? Not him specifically, but wealthy donors who might be interested. I really haven't tried that much, you know, because. Uh, I figure if something's right, it'll sell itself. You don't have to sell it. And this is selling itself. This is selling itself to real people. Mm -hmm. And, mm -hmm. you know, if, usually there's a stipulation. If somebody's going to give you a million dollars to do something, they're going to want a certain look or a certain this or a certain that. And we don't really want to do that. We want to go and shoot from the hip and say, this is the way we think it should be done. And we do it. You know, me and Phil and Roy and Brian, and we just figure it out. And we don't want really this kind of work to be governed by some, you know, donors' opinions. I mean, if sure, if Bill Gates come and said, I'll give you a million dollars and do what you want with it for any of these causes, well, sure, we'd be fine with that. I mean, I had, I had many years ago 
some people give me uh, 150 grand a year for three years just to develop some of these ideas and, and I turned it down twice uh, because I didn't want them to tell me what to do and finally I said look we'll give you the money and we don't care what you do just report to us what you've done and I said okay so that helped us yeah. so it's like but but I really like the thing that uh, is going on now with the it's not really crowdfunding it's it's human equity kind of it's human funding so it's really working that way because you've got people here that are invested in this building they've invested a thousand dollars and ten days of busting their ass so they got to be serious and they are that's why it happens Mm. so we're um, talking about um, well you've said you'll uh, uh, um, give a scholarship for villagers here to come to Taos or to the next build wherever it's going to be to um, for them to actually learn the concepts and I mean you learn it from from being here on site but there's no way in one build that you can learn everything about right. the whole thing so obviously you know maybe they can come to the next three or four builds or to the academy um, so you guys are providing free scholarships for villagers and yeah. so uh, as volunteers or the broader community they could what, what else do you need funds for basically is it what you, you answer yeah well the the academy uh we do four we're doing five of them in taos this spring summer and fall and then two in south america next winter so we'll have seven academies and so we give uh, probably two or three scholarships every one of them. It's, each academy has about 40 people and we give two or three scholarships away each time. So wherever there's an academy that's close, uh, then we give a scholarship. Because mm. um, what the Earth Village group's talking about is sending seven people, um, three or four villages from here, someone as a translator, and, uh, and then two people from uh, that, that are volunteers but that are architects in the Philippines mm-hmm. and the translator also being the person from Earth Village. So that whole group being a part of um, the academy in Taos or in Australia if it comes to Australia. Um, so we're looking at what, what else, uh, apart from the scholarship, do they need, I guess, flights and... Flights and uh, sometimes housing. Sometimes when it's in Taos, we provide the housing with... The scholarship, okay. but if it's somewhere else, we're having to pay for the housing too. So we we take some yeah, uh, we travel and accommodations, travel and accommodation, uh, or just travel. Yeah. Okay. One more question. This being from America, definitely this uh, windship design would be applicable to the whole eastern seaboard where they get hurricanes typically. Um, one, do you think that? that might be a place to go for another build and two do you think it's going to take a disaster like Haiyan for people on the eastern seaboard to realize that they need to be designing this way well there's so much other than just hurricanes in New York and typhoons in Philippines there's a lot of climate change going on probably a little more than there used to be and people are realizing that that when you put that together with what we are doing for energy right now we're making nuclear power plants and and totally destroying the whole northern hemisphere and uh, people are starting to realize that there's got to be a better way and it, and you know just the, the quick explanation of a better way is that each building is self-contained that it interfaces and encounters the natural phenomena of the earth breathing in breathing out just like plants, just like animals, uh, buildings need to do that rather than needing all of these utilities and infrastructure. And that concept alone could change things radically. And that concept could make it a lot easier to rebuild the next time uh, on the eastern seaboard, to rebuild with something that's going to stand up. I mean, like in Louisiana, they wanted us to rebuild there with some earth ships, but they wanted it down in the flood zone. And I said, I'm not going to build there because it's going to be underwater anyway. No matter how well we build it, it's going to flood out because it's it's below the levee line. So we are making logical choices. If somebody wants us to rebuild in Louisiana up on a high plateau, yes. Uh, So we can make buildings with, you know, the wind ship would be great for, for, you know, a tornado alley 
in the U.S. or the eastern seaboard where all the hurricanes hit. It'd be great. This, this design will probably get used in other places in the U.S. Can you give us a quick description of, of an Earthship in Taos, uh, your climate, and you were saying before about the, you know, like when you walk out and it's winter outside and... Well, you know. you've, in Taos it gets uh, as much as 35 below zero Fahrenheit. That's mm-hmm. cold enough to the inside of your nose freezes. And, uh, and it gets hot just like this. And so in those two extremes, when you're in an airship, uh, you don't know what it is outside. You can look out and it's sunny or dark, but you just don't, you, you go outside and you go, oh my God, I didn't realize it was that cold. Because you're in there with banana trees and there's no fuel and you have plants growing. I've seen bananas on the tree, uh, looking through the banana tree at two feet of snow outside. Um, it's warm. I have big thermometers at my house where I look through and see the temperature outside and then I see the temperature in the outer greenhouse and then I see the temperature in the house. And it's, the house is always, you know, comfortable without fuel of any kind. I mean, I'll be able to fire sometimes for, you know, to be romantic or snuggly or whatever, but uh, for atmosphere. But uh, it's, it's just, uh, I come home in uh, late January, you know, after having a few margaritas, I'll open my door and my house embraces me with warmth. And there's no, no fire burning, no heater on. It's just amazing. It, and, and people don't know that that's possible. I mean, as long as we've been doing it. I've been doing it over 40 years, and people still don't know. The majority of the people on the planet don't know that that's possible, and certainly they don't know that catching water from the sky is possible. Treating your own sewage and not putting it into rivers and streams is possible. They just don't know these things are possible, and they really don't know how easy they are. But things are getting bad enough that they're starting to look for something. Do you think airships are necessarily a rural type of solution or can they also be applied to dense cities like San Francisco or Seattle? Or? We're actually working on a design right now that has made it through two council meetings in midtown Manhattan. So it's it, these principles can be applied anywhere. It's just that most of, them, most of the time it's been applied in rural areas, but um, they can be applied anywhere. It's just principles. It's biology and physics. You take the biology and physics and apply it to your situation. It's more important to, for us to teach the biology and the physics that makes this work 